district of England has been featured in song and story for centuries. And among the authors and poets inspired by its scenic beauty were Spencer, Gray, Shelley, Coleridge, Ruskin, and William Wordsworth, who probably contributed more than any other writer to the fame of this inspiring region. The queen of the 16 lakes in the district is Windermere, the largest lake in all of England. Unique ferry boats like this one are used to connect the important traffic routes throughout the lake district. Outstanding among the historic landmarks in this region is the old grammar school at Hawkshead, which the poet William Wordsworth attended from 1778 to 1783. The old sundial over the doorway once confirmed the hour of arrival and departure for the school children who crossed the threshold below, and it still casts a shadow over its old face for the curious tourists who gaze upon it today. Not far from the schoolhouse is the quaint little town of Hawkshead, typical of numerous other villages scattered here and there throughout the Lake District. Aside from the modern motor cars that occasionally pass through its main thoroughfare, Hawkshead lives in the past, very much the same as it was in the days when the poet Wordsworth walked and dreamed in its streets. It was while residing in this cottage that Wordsworth is said to have written most of his best-known poems. Among the famous guests who visited with him here were Sir Walter Scott and Samuel Coleridge. Not far from here stands the little church of St. Oswald, in the old graveyard of which lie the mortal remains of William Wordsworth and members of his family. No epitaph adorns his tombstone, but his immortal verses will always be a tribute to his memory. Undoubtedly, the happiest years of Wordsworth's life were spent in the Lake District, and scenes like this were the unfailing source of his inspiration. This rose-covered bar is the modest fulfillment of an artist's dream, and it provides a perfect setting for our introduction to the caretaker's little daughter, who curiously toddles out from her floral abode to investigate the presence of strangers. At the foothills of the Lake District, Along the northwestern coast of England lies Markham Bay, one of the most popular holiday and health resorts in the British Isles. Markham is one of the few seaside resorts having spa waters with medicinal qualities. The springs rise on the northern shores of the bay, and it is recorded that they were used as a curative by the monks of the ancient Cartmel Priory more than 500 years ago. Although the sports of bowling, tennis, golf, cricket, boating, and fishing are very popular here, the outstanding attraction appears to be the great open-air swimming stadium which is one of the largest of its kind in the world. The pool is 330 feet long and 99 feet wide. It has a total holding capacity of a million and a quarter gallons of water, which is drawn from the open sea, 
and carefully filtered and chemically treated from hour to hour. A unique feature of the pool is the seating arrangement for thousands of spectators. About 80 miles from here lies the ancient city of York, one of the most historic centers in the United Kingdom. As far back as the year 71 AD, this grand old metropolis was the military headquarters of Roman legions, and some evidence of practically every important period in the history of England is preserved in its landmarks, the most outstanding of which is the famous York Minster, built in the latter part of the 15th century. This historic old edifice has been damaged by fire on two occasions. The bombs of modern warfare have menaced it, and cannonballs from Cromwell's army have bounded along its outer pavements. It has been robbed of its treasures and stripped of its ornaments by puritanical fanatics. But in spite of all, it still stands as one of the most magnificent buildings in the world. This tower is all that remains of an ancient castle dating back to the middle of the 13th century. Recent excavations have unearthed human skeletons as tragic evidence of the political prisoners who were formerly cast into a deep dungeon in the center of the tower. Other excavations recently performed have revealed the early history of the ancient wall of York, which encircles the original town for a distance of about three miles. When the Normans first came here, much of the old Roman wall was still standing. For some unknown reason, the Normans covered it with a great mound upon which the present wall was built. Although it was constructed in the early part of the 13th century, the people of York often refer to it as the modern wall. In medieval times, there were five gateways leading into the town, and each one was heavily fortified. This is one of the gateways to that section of the city which is known as Roman York. York is now a busy and progressive metropolis with over 100,000 inhabitants, and although it has taken full advantage of modern innovations, it has artfully managed to do so without sacrificing the charm of its ancient landmarks an impressive illustration of which is to be seen in the ruins of St. Mary's Abbey, located almost in the heart of the city. This was a Benedictine monastery founded by William Rufus in the year of 1098. Verily, the ancient city of York has well endured the transitions of time, and we of this generation may learn much from its undying traditions. And it is with this thought that we now conclude our tour of Northern England.